about it this last week because when all hope is lost um, in everything, I never lose hope in, in the Lord. I never falter in my belief that God loves me and that um, he watches over me. And I, I never um, have worried about that relationship. I may worry about relationships with other people, but I've never worried about my relationship with Jesus. And the reason is not because of me. Because if it was left solely to me, the relationship would probably be a disaster. But it's not. It's Jesus being able to, being able to have a relationship with someone that is perfect and who loves me no matter what uh, makes it kind of easy. And so I wanted to talk about that today as to why it is that I love Jesus. Now, my opening verse comes from Deuteronomy 6, uh, 4, and 5. This is the Shema. It's, oh, again I forgot? It just shouldn't be that hard anymore. How long have I been doing this? Thank you, Susan. Well, welcome. No, i just kidding. <clears throat> the Shema is, I believe, probably the most often spoken prayer in Judaism. I know that it was the most often heard prayer around my house growing up from my grandparents. And in Hebrew, it goes, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kavod Melchuto Leolam Va'ed. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. And it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Is there anything else? You shall love the Lord with all your heart. What does that mean, to love the Lord with all your heart? It means that every emotion that encompasses me, that controls me, has to be turned over to God. It says, with all your soul, what does that mean? It means that that most spiritual part of me, that part that is in the greatest, uh, that has that connection to the Holy Spirit, all of that has to be committed to God. I can't have any outside things that are competing for that love that I have for God. And with all my strength means that even in my times of the greatest weakness, I have to be at 100% for God all the time. Now, 100% <clears throat> today may be different than my 100% tomorrow. And my 100% a few days ago may have been really low on the scale for my scale of how much I love God, but I still have to be at that 100%. Because when I am weak, he is strong. Wouldn't it be terrible if when I was weak, God was weak? Because I wouldn't have the hope that I do to be able to make it through from day to day. Uh, verse 6 and 7, it goes on and it says, And these words which I command you today uh, sh uh, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. So we should be in this relationship with God all the time. i got to tell you a funny story. <clears throat> I may have told you this before, but I think I was relatively new as a Christian, and I'm driving along, and I come up to a stoplight, a red light, and there's a car in front of me, and it's got a bumper sticker on it, and it says, honk if you love Jesus. I'm like, yeah, honk, and he flips me the bird out the window, because he must have thought I was honking for him to get through the red light, and I got really upset. I'm new, and I got out of my car, and and uh, I went over and I scraped that bumper sticker off his bumper as best as I could before he took off. Someone told me maybe he bought the car and the sticker was on there or the car belonged to somebody else and he didn't know it was there. But if you're going to put a honk if you love Jesus on your car and somebody honks, <clears throat> we should be praising God, Amen. not um, threatening the person behind us. So I have four reasons why I love the Lord, and I wanted to go over those with you today. And reason one is because he created me, right? 
he didn't just make me like the other animals in Genesis and, and the flowers and the birds. and He took clay or dirt from the earth. Think about this. And with his hands, he molded me into the person that he wanted me to be in the image of himself. Can you imagine that? This God, who's the creator of everything we could ever know, who's infinite, we don't even begin to be able to conceive in our puny little human minds the magnanimity of God and of of the triune God, of the fact that he was here before time. What does that even mean? And he will be here after time, which is even more confusing for us. And then this infinite existence of controlling everything within all the universes of all the galaxies and everything that is beyond even our imagination. He took the time to make me and you. Isn't that incredible? That God who could have blinked us into existence or spoke us like he did everything else into existence, he didn't. He formed me from the dirt of the earth. I don't know, how, I, I, in my mind, I can only imagine it's like when people do those sand sculptures at the beach or something, and there's that perfect human being into that sand sculpture, and then he breathed life into me. I don't know about you. Hollywood couldn't even compete with that kind of a story. And it's beyond my conception. I see it. I hear it. I read it. I don't get it. I just don't get how you could do that. You know? But that's what he did. He created me because he loves me. And he wanted me to be able to worship him so that I would have a life so full and that I would have the opportunity to spend eternity with him. Genesis 1, 26 and 28 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God... He created him, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. In Genesis 2, verse 7, it says, And the Lord formed God, or the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living thing. Wouldn't you love to have seen that happen? Imagine the angels just gathered all around like a huge, I don't know, amphitheater. And they're watching as God does this and he forms this person in his likeness and he breathes into his nostrils and they come up out of the dirt and they're a live human being and he forms a woman from the man. And here's this perfect thing. Boy, have we made a mess. Have we made a mess of what God created? I can't wait to get back to that. Well, not for me back to it, but to what I have seen in the Bible is what we are going to get to. In Signs of the Times, October 10th, 1900, uh, paragraph 10, it reads this, if the flower is given a beauty that outvies the glory of Solomon, what can, the measurement, what can be the measurement of the estimate God places on his purchased heritage? It's us. Christ points to the care bestowed on the things that wither in a day to show us how much love God must have for the beings created in his own image. Reason number two is because he loved me first. I happen to be an unlovable person. I know you may not think that or see that. You're going, no, not you, Frank. Not you, Frank. But yes, my nature is horrible. 
who I was before a Christian and who I will be or would be without Jesus in my life, I'm a terrible, filthy human being. But Jesus loved me so much. God loves me so much, he allowed me to experience the consequences of my actions through free will. He didn't force me anywhere. My love for God is a chosen love. It's not a forced love. I don't have to love him if I don't want to. I can choose to walk away. But why in the world would I do that? Why would I walk away from such a perfect relationship? God loved me before I was even able to love myself. John 4.10 says, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, this is the woman at the well, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. In John 15, 9 and 10, it says, as the father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. And in Romans 5, 8 and 9, it says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Can God love us while we are sinning? Can he? Yeah. Well, John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If we're not keeping his commandments, it says God hates sin. And there's some discussion, which we're going to have. Can't wait. I can't wait. About unconditional love in God. But I can feel it. Can you feel it? Do you ever feel that God loves you? Even when you're in your downest, worstest, miserablest times, when, when everything is falling apart around you and it feels like you may never get out of that hole, can you feel God's love? I believe so, because I think that if we didn't, we might take our own lives. I do. I think that in those times when I am in that... Um, the um, th that hole, the most miserable place I can think for my life, that if I didn't still feel the love of God, that hope wasn't there, I think I would have taken my life years ago. And I think that that could still happen if I chose to give that, that up because all hope for everything would be gone. And, and I don't know about you, I'm okay being miserable sometimes. Maybe sometimes I even enjoy a little pity party once in a while. But I don't want to be so hopeless that I, I want to put a bullet in my head because I don't see that there's any way out of, of the difficulties that I might have. God loved me first. In Review and Herald, it says, uh, it was written, I want to present the religion of Jesus Christ as it is. You are to feel that you are the most favored of all people upon the face of the earth. Sometimes I get a little upset with other people. Uh, Susan will remind me sometimes, or she might say something like, maybe God loves them more than you, which probably isn't true, but it puts it into perspective. Who am I? To, to not love another person that God loves. In essence, if I'm saying that another person is unlovable and God loves that person, by logic, I'm saying that God is wrong. And I don't want to be in a position to ever uh, be able to make that assumption because it's not true. It says, you must feel that you are the children of God, highly honored of him. You can say, I love Jesus because what? He first loved me. The story goes that a wife, uh, she went with her friend to the police station to report that her husband was missing. Uh, he had been missing for a few days, and when the policeman asked for the description, she said, well, he's six foot two, he's got deep blue eyes, dark wavy hair, an athletic build, he's well-groomed, sharply dressed, he's 185 pounds, soft-spoken, well-mannered, kind, gentle, spiritual, he loves children. The friend spoke up and said, wait a minute, your husband's 5'3", he's fat, he smokes, he's rude, he's bald, he's got a big mouth, he never bays, he dressed sloppy, 
his teeth are rotten and he's mean to you and the kids. And she says, well, why would I want him back? Okay, that was my attempt at a joke. Probably didn't work very well, but, but I want you guys to think about that because sometime later today, five, six o'clock, you'll be sitting around and you're gonna go, oh, I got it. So, so, that's why I'm not a comedian and I'm up here. Reason three, the third reason that I love God and that I love the Lord is that he was willing to allow his son to go to a brutal death because I'm not capable of living a life of righteousness. Think about that. Think about that. He was willing to give up his only begotten son so that I would have a chance and a hope at salvation. You know what, this, gosh, it's just the saddest thing I can think of is that people who choose not to go that route you know, being lost is not a punishment, it's a choice. Just like salvation is a choice. I choose to be saved by my, my faith in God. And hopefully my hands reflect that. My feet and my mouth reflect that faith in Jesus. But there are people who make a conscious choice after hearing the truth to walk away from that, and I don't get it. Maybe I'm too far from that now. That was my choice but not, not anymore, not for many years. And maybe I'm so far from that part that I just forgot what that was like, but I cannot imagine what could be going on in a person's head that would have them choose eternal death over eternal life with God. It just, I don't get it. But it's a choice that people make. I'm not going to do that. I don't want the death of Jesus to go in vain. Because you know, why, you know why he went to that cross? Because I'm unrighteous. He died that horrible, terrible death because I'm a sinner. And he loved me so much that even though I wasn't willing to follow the commandments, he was willing to go to his death so that I would have a hope of salvation. Guys, I don't know anybody else that would put that kind of sacrifice up for me. Do you? I might give my life for you. I would take the bullet for you, but that will never compare to what Jesus did for me ever. How could I not be bound to that person? I just, you know, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. In Conflict and Courage, Ms. White writes this. She says, In freeing our souls from the bondage of sin, God has wrought for us a deliverance greater than that of the Hebrew at the Red Sea. You hear that? Moses steps in the Red Sea. They line up 10,000 to cross that Red Sea parts five miles, and they march through in 24 hours to save themselves from the chariots that are coming behind them. And that doesn't even compare, it says. Amen. Not even compare. Like the Hebrew host, we should praise the Lord with heart and soul and voice for his wonderful works to the children of men. Those who dwell, up, dwell upon God's great mercies and are not unmindful of his lesser gifts will put on the girdle of gladness and make melody in their hearts to the Lord. The daily blessings that we receive from the hand of God and above all else the death of Jesus to bring happiness in heaven within our reach should be a theme for constant gratitude. John 3, 16 and 17, need I say it? For, the God so, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Should have everlasting life. So who killed Jesus? Oh, my, my Uncle Jerry used to think it was him. Because when we grew up in the Jewish neighborhoods down in Hamtramck and, and, and Royal Oak, Michigan, and those areas, and he was out playing, the, the Christian kids would come through and they'd yell at him, Jesus killer, you're a Jesus killer. And, and he said one day when we were having Thanksgiving, he said, I finally went in the house and I asked my mom, I said, who is this Jesus guy? And I didn't kill anybody, he said. Did we all kill Jesus? Well, was it the Pharisees, right? 
Matthew 12, 14 says, but the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. That's pretty much, if, if this was a court of law, that'd be evidence. And she told them we don't talk about it. Yes, and she said, we don't talk about it. That's right. <laughs> and maybe he went to his grave without knowing Jesus. I hope not, but. He yep. Yeah, he loves Seventh-day Adventists, he said, because we, we never bothered him. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or not either. But. I don't know. Was it Pilate that killed him? Pilate had a chance to let him go, but he said, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? He gave an option for someone else to be freed instead. Or was it the crowd? What did they do? They said, let him be crucified. Was it the soldiers? Well, they crucified him. They beat him, put him on the cross, speared him, divided his garments, casting lots, right? Or was it you and me? There isn't all the above. But I think there's one above all. And Isaiah 53, 5 says it. He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. <sighs> you know, being raised Jewish, I had to be in just a lot of guilt about this whole thing. Jesus died because of me, my rebellion, my sins. I should feel worse about it. Maybe than I do sometimes. Maybe what I need to do is contemplate it more than I do. He was whipped so we could be healed. It was for our sins that Jesus died. And if we had not sinned, if there was no sin, then his death would not have been necessary. That is a Boolean logic model. And you, you can't get away from that. Amen. His father gave him up for us. Romans 8.32 says, since he did not spare even his own son for us, but gave him up for us all, won't we also surely give up everything else? He said to the rich man, hey, you've done it all. Go out, get rid of your stuff and follow me. And he didn't just go away. He went away sad. Isaiah 53.10 says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus paid the ultimate price. In Matthew 26, 39, it says he went a little further and fell on his face and he prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. What does that mean, this cup? You know, in the Bible, there was an illusion of this that went to, the, um, to where... Um, uh, People who did wrong were sentenced to death by poison. And it wasn't like they do now where they strap them down and they inject it into their veins. They had to take the cup of poison and they had to drink it themselves. How was Socrates killed? Hemlock. That's right. He drank a cup of hemlock juice, which is deadly poison. Jesus knew what was going to happen. And he said, hey, if there's any other way to do this besides what I'm about to go through, I'm all in. But the most important thing is not what happens to me, he said. It's that God's will is done. Is that our attitude? Does it matter what happens to me? No, I don't care. I've been through all the physical trauma and emotional trauma that I can imagine I could go through and still survive, I don't care. I will gladly give my life if it meant that somebody else would have a chance at salvation because I'm looking forward to salvation. I'll take the next ticket out of here if it means that where I'm going is perfection. 
let us ask for God's will in our life. It's okay to say, if it's, you, you know, if it's possible, let's do this some other way, but let's not walk away from those opportunities that were given by God. Hebrews 2.9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Reason four. I love God because he's worthy of being loved. Have you ever, like, well, I don't know how it works. You love someone because you have to not because they're worthy of being loved. I guess I haven't never done that with a person. I can't think of anyone that I can tell you that I love that person, even though, well, yeah, I guess out of grace we do. We love people even if they're unlovable. But God is worthy of that love that we give to him. Psalms 116, 1 through 9 says, I love the Lord because he hears my prayers and answers them. Because he bends down and listens, I will pray as long as I breathe. Death stared me in the face. I was frightened and sad. And then I cried, Lord, save me. How kind he is. How good he is. So merciful, this God of ours. The Lord protects the simple and the childlike. I was facing death, and then he saved me. Now I can relax. For the Lord has done this wonderful miracle for me. He has saved me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I shall live, yes, in his presence here on earth. And so what do I want to do? Well, I want to show God my love. That's what I want to do. Romans 8, 36 and 39 says, The scriptures tell us for his sake we must be ready to face death at every moment of the day, we are like sheep awaiting slaughter. Is that us? I mean, I don't think we need to live in this hypervigilant, anxiety, high anxiety state. But if I I'm, if I'm, have the full armor of God on and I'm abiding with the Holy Spirit, if I have this relationship with Jesus Christ, then I'm ready for death right now. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to be afraid of it. I'm just ready. That's all. I'm not asking for it. I'm not looking for it. But I'm certainly not going to run away from it if, if it's time. And so, you know, we're ready. We're supposed to give our testimony, right, in season and out of season, to be ready at all times. We are like sheep waiting slaughter. But, and the, the thing, I think what that means is the sheep don't know they're waiting for slaughter. They're just la -da 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 -da, having a great time out there in the pasture and then it's time. They don't walk around with this, oh my, oh no, when's it gonna happen, you know? When, when am I gonna get like slaughtered? It's, they don't have that sense of anxiety like people do. But despite all this, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us enough to die for us. For I am convinced, listen, this is one of my favorite verses. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't, and life can't, and the angels won't. And all the powers of hell itself cannot keep God's love away. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, or where we are, high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing will be ever to help to separate us from the love of God demonstrated by our Lord Jesus Christ when he died for us. Mm -mm. So what do we do? Well, I vote we praise God. That's my vote. In the good times and the bad. Job said what? Should I only praise God when times are good and not when times are bad as well? Boy, that makes me kind of a fair-weathered, Worshipper, doesn't it? That can't be us. We praise him in the good times because the times are good. And we praise him in the bad times because the times had been good and they will probably be good again. We have friends. They believe this whole thing is cyclical, right? It's going to get bad. It's going to get better. It's going to get worse. It's going to get better. It's going to get worse. It's going to get better. It's not. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And it's going to get worse. And, and there's a term called entropy, which says that basically everything in nature goes towards chaos. 
And that's what we're up against. So we got to get our heads around this and get, our, get ourselves right. This is a beautiful place for us to be with our friends and our family and the people with whom we worship. But let us not think for a moment that when we see all this bad stuff happening, that's okay, it'll get better. It's not. And we need to be prepared and willing to go to the grave in order to carry the message to those who need to hear it. We know where we're going. Other people don't. Let us be the, the light of hope to other folks. So in closing, in closing, Psalm 34, 1 through 10. It says, I will praise the Lord no matter what happens. I will constantly speak of his glories and grace. I will boast of all his kindness to me. Let all who are discouraged take heart. Let us praise the Lord together and exalt his name. For I cried to him and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Others too were radiant at what he did for them. Theirs was no downcast look of rejection. This poor man cried to the Lord and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. For the angel of the Lord guards and rescues all who reverence him. Oh, put God to the test and see how kind he is. Let's do that. See for yourself the way his mercy showered down on all who trust in him. If you belong to the Lord, reverence him. For everyone who does this has everything he needs. Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry. But those of us who reverence the Lord will never lack any good thing. You ready to put him to the test? Amen. Doris? All right, you've been doing this a while with me. What comes next? A challenge. And it's simple today. Sometime before the Sabbath is over today, I want you to read Psalm 147. Will you do that for me? That's all. Let's just read Psalm 147 before the end of the Sabbath. I'll do it. Maybe we'll do it together at the picnic. We'll read through it. But let's do that today. Okay, well, let us close in our usual manner. For those who are guests or haven't seen this, I'm not speaking in tongues. When I was um, uh, growing up, my grandfather would end the Sabbath with what's called the Aaronic Blessing. It's a number 6, 23, 24, 25 in there. He would say it in Hebrew, and then he would repeat it in English, which I like to do to close the Sabbath. So let us bow our heads. Yivrecha Adonai v'yishmarecha ye'ar Adonai panavalecha v'ikunecha. Yisaw Adonai panavalecha v'yashem lecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And everybody said? Amen. Dismissed. Okay.